Hi, Sean. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank Welcome. you so much for joining. Thank you. My pleasure. Hey, Michael. Hey, Sean. Hey. Hi. How are you? Well, I let me just do a quick introduction. It's pretty much very informal. We just ask you a lot of questions. You give us answers. Fill in whatever you like. And okay. along the way, our, uh, um, our fans who are also there, as you can see, they will be, uh, op the floor will be open for them to ask questions as well. So, Sounds good. Right. So without uh, further ado, let's start the show. So Michael, Hope, take it away. Sean, um, <laughs> did you watch the Emmys last night? What did you think? Um, I watched them at five. I got the, uh, the CBS All Access and um, it was working for a minute. Right. And then it kicked me. And so I had to call a friend of the East Coast and I watched by having him hold his phone up to the TV. Yeah. Super low tech, and I did not watch it again. Um, what did you think of what you saw? It was the best show that could have been made given the incredible constraints that it was. Correct. Um, no one's enth enthusiasm was dampened as a result of not being there in person. And, um, you know, um, yeah. And to your knowledge, what is the next step for the, um, in terms of a ceremony with the additional digital categories? So for the, for the additional digital categories, they're going to be doing a virtual show, much like last night, I imagine on a, a smaller scale, on July 19th. Uh, and they've requested that all of the, uh, the casts get together in one location. And, uh, you know, barring any, um, you know, enormous resurgence of the pandemic and, and, you know, us being told that we can't do it, uh, right. We at Studio City are planning on uh, all gathering on, on July 19th and uh, making a really nice event of it. And, um, you know, we're still nominated for seven more awards. And we're optimistic that, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to take some statues home. Awesome. How Studio City, for anyone who hasn't seen it, how would you describe the show? So Studio City is a short form digital drama. There's six episodes in the first season. They range between 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, the show has been um, a sort of labor of love for me for a really long time. For more than 10 years, I've been trying to get this made in different incarnations. Uh, the show centers around my character, whose name is uh, Sam Stevens, and he plays Dr. Pierce Hartley on the number two soap opera in the world, Hearts on Fire. And you know, he's a guy that has lived much of his life in kind of the B minus level of daytime fame. And from the outside in, you think this guy really has the world by the tail. I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's got some fame and he's obviously probably got some money and he's on TV, et cetera. But really, as you unpeel the onion, you learn that he deals with many of the same uh, issues that everyone does. He's got mommy issues. He's got a troubled relationship. He's no longer the young leading guy on the show. Uh, he's in contract negotiations, so the producers have brought on kind of a, a younger, better looking version of him to nip at his heels. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and I think ultimately he's a guy that always felt that he should have had a little bit bigger career than he did. And in his mind, that's, that's being an action star. And um, having a bigger life comes in the form of somebody that he never knew existed at the end of the pilot. You know, the, the thing that I really like about Studio City is that, um, you know, we really deal with some significant socially relevant issues. We deal with Me Too, we deal with ageism, um, we deal with... Um, we do a suicide. We've got an LGBTQ storyline we're really proud of. Um, as a matter of fact, Scott Turner Schofield, who's one of our actors, has made history. He is the first actor uh, that is a trans man actor to be nominated for an Emmy. Uh, and we're really fortunate that that happened on Studio City. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's a show that packs a lot into a very short amount of time. Um, the challenge is how do you get an audience to connect with characters they've never, never met before because it's, it's the first season, and how do you tell poignant and compelling story dealing with some important social issues without beating someone over the head and remembering that ultimately 
this is a show meant to entertain. Uh, and, and, you know, fortunately, if I do say so myself, I think that we managed to, to strike that balance pretty well. Are there, are there nods to um, things that really go on backstage in the soap world that fans will say, oh yeah, I've always heard that's the case? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, uh, look, here's the thing. Almost every time that we have seen soap operas portrayed in the media, be it Soap Dish, which I thought was a terrific film, or some of the other things, the acting within the soap operas, within the show, is always done in kind of an overly hyperbolic manner that's almost as if to say that the actors know that we're acting on a soap opera, so we have to really do this right. kind of heightened melodramatic acting to let you know that we're real actors and this is what it's like, which is bullshit because you know, some of the best actors I've ever worked with are on daytime. And so what I wanted to do was play the scenes within the show about 92% straight. 95% straight, allowing the circumstance to occasionally make them funny, but not to do some kind of stylized bad acting. Because I, I find that really offensive, that bug. The, the Dr. Drake Ramore thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. <laughs> but to, to, to really answer your question, Michael, yeah, there's, listen, you know, the very first thing, the ageism aspect. I mean, I mean, that's something definitely, you know, if you've been on a soap opera for a long time, whether you're a male and probably more so if you're if you're a woman, you deal with. And I, I wanted to deal with that. I wanted to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, it is a business at the end of the day. You know, the, the, the job of television is to sell commercials. That's what it is. And if you're able to do good work in between selling those commercials, that's wonderful and you can charge more for those commercials. But, you know, in the scenes you see me in with Carolyn Hennessy, um, you see that she's clearly under pressure by... Her, her superiors to make the show leaner and meaner and more successful. And that's absolutely something that's a reality in daytime. Um, I think that, you know, I've been fortunate that for the most part, I've had really wonderful people that I've worked with, but that doesn't mean that from time to time there aren't egos and um, shark-like competitiveness that surfaces. I wanted to show some of that. Um, um, but I also wanted to show that at the end of the day, because in soap operas, you're turning out so much product because you're putting out a show a day, that one positive thing is it allows you, when I say you, it allows the writers and producers to pull subject matter right from the headlines and have really pertinent, timely issues. You know, we've always done that on Bold and the Beautiful in General Hospital. Um, General Hospital, we had a huge uh, AIDS storyline. Um, you know, Bold and the Beautiful, we had a transgender storyline, and I wanted to show that that's one of the positive things about daytime, and I wanted to deal with those sort of issues both within the show, uh, on Studio City, and in the, the real world outside. You were bringing up um, Bold and the Beautiful. You've said that Deacon is one of your favorite roles. Mm -hmm. Is that so, and why? <laughs> well, um... You know, and Michael can kind of attest to some of this because he was there. You know, the first thing is that, that it's a role that I was privileged to originate and that no one else has played. Uh, it's a role that also I was not only able to play on Bold the Beautiful, but I was able to play on The Young and the Restless. Um, but the thing I really like about Deacon Sharp is that, you know, in the beginning he came on the show and was really just a morally reprehensible bad guy. And as the character developed, there were bits and pieces of gray that started to emerge. And I find that the, the, the most interesting characters anywhere, whether it's soap opera or anything, even in a novel, are, are the characters that live their lives not in black and white, but in shades of gray. Because I, I think ultimately, none of us are any one thing. Um, I also was we were able to really push the envelope and do things with the character that really hadn't been done before. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but you know, when Deacon first came on the show, I smoked on the show. Nobody smoked on the show. And I'm not advocating that, but you know, I, I was able to really, you know, we were able to really push the boundaries with some of the love scenes, with some of the dialogue. And I felt that it really helped make the character um, as, as gritty and raw as you can make a character on network television. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and the fans really took to Deacon. 
And, uh, you know, it's funny. It's like, I don't know if you guys remember the movie Gladiator, but there's a scene when Proximus says to Maximus, he says, you know, when they start cheering for you, you'll start to love them. And then, you know, the more they love you, the more you love them. And it was just like, I got so taken in by how much, you know, people liked Deacon that it just, that fueled me, that fired me up to want to do better and better. And you know what I mean? It became a very reciprocal and in some ways um, symbiotic relationship between me and the work I was doing and, and, you know, knowing that the fans were really invested in the character. So um, yeah, I love the character. It's, it's one of the best characters I've ever had the chance to play. And just to clarify, Deacon's in jail, but is he, was he responsible for the shooting or was he framed for it? I don't think Deacon's a killer. I no. think Deacon does no. lots of things. I think Deacon is not adverse to a cocktail and a fist fight and blackmail, but I don't think he's a killer. And you know, one thing, I, another thing I, I really liked about the character was as, as bad as he was and as many horrible things as he did, he, he has sort of a weird, logical only to him code of honor right. and you know there are certain things about him like hope for instance that he is he's a real good soldier and uh that's what i think makes the character interesting he's able to do such horrible things yet there's other times that he's able to come through on the Thank topic you. of uh projects that you've been working on, though. I noticed you didn't mention your books. Success Factor X is my second book. My partner, Jill Lieberman, and I went out to 50 people, exceptional people in all different uh, fields. And we said, what's your best advice about success? And we got an amazing response. We got a response from everybody from Mark Cuban and Sarah Blakely, the first female billionaire, to Anthony Robbins, to um, Major League Baseball players, football players, Olympic gold athletes, um, Daryl McDaniels, the founding member of Run DMC. Uh, we are well represented from the daytime community. Uh, Tristan Rogers, uh, Susan Lucci, uh, Scott Turner Schofield. Um, I know I'm forgetting like uh, Jennifer Finnegan, um, uh, Kate Linder. Um, and what's interesting is the book looks like kind of like a coffee table book. And it's organic advice from these people that are all successful. And they, you know what's interesting is that my, my acting teacher, the late Roy London, used to always say, I've got more in common with an unsuccessful, I'm sorry, with a successful plumber than an unsuccessful acting teacher. Meaning the very same things that it takes to reach success in any field, whether it's a plumber or anything, are the very same things that I've had to do to be successful. And I think success leaves clues and has common denominators. And, and that's one of the interesting things when you read the book. You see all these people that have achieved success in different fields, a lot of times employ some of the same strategies. You start thinking, well, maybe some of these are worth taking a look at. Elizabeth okay. Ann said, I know it was a long time ago, but I still love the movie Karate Kid. Are you still able to do some of the moves from the film? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, martial arts has been something that's been incredibly important to me all my life. Um, so, so yeah. Um, I know that you had done Italian um, Dancing with the Stars a while ago. And my question is, was it harder to do acting or was it harder to do the dancing? That's from one of our fans there. Competitive ballroom dancing is 1,000% a sport, okay? I mean, it, it is physical beyond physical. Um, it was one of the hardest things I had to do. I, I, I had never learned to dance before. Um, I had to do it in a foreign language. Uh, and when you're the man, you lead. You know the old joke? What, what's the old joke, Michael, about Ginger and Fred? Uh, Fred Astaire did all, all these things, uh, all this kind of dancing, and Ginger Rogers did it backwards and in heels. Exactly. I forgot. Right. Mm -hmm. which which is true generally speaking you know it's 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 harder for the woman but but when you're a man though you have to lead and if you don't know how to dance you're leading your partner but you're you're the beginner so <clears throat> it was really hard is it harder than acting for me it was you know i mean because I, I you know i think a lot of little girls grow up learning to dance it's one of those things that you know a lot of them get stuck in so they've got kind of a, a basis for it I, I never did and what's really cool was you know, I always wanted to learn to dance. And I, I think I did the show when I was about 42. And I was like, wow, I'm 42 years old. It's going to be one of those things that I just am never going to learn to do. And then the universe presented this opportunity. And I mean, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to win any, any ballroom dancing awards, but you know, I'm definitely 
better than I was before I started. And it was a phenomenal experience. I, I had never lived in a foreign country before. Uh, I got to live in Italy for a long time and Italy is now a second home to me. How many, uh, how many dance, uh, dance, I guess, routines did you actually have to learn and how many was it like per week? I that's a good question. So you're really learning a new dance a week, maybe once every two weeks. But what's hard about it is you, you not only have to learn the essence of the dance, which each dance has its own components to it, right? Then you have to learn the choreography. So in other words, if you knew how to dance, say the rumba, but you didn't know the choreography, much easier to learn, right? It's, it's kind of, I guess this is a good, a good way to uh, equate it. People always say to me, how can you learn so many lines on daytime, right? Well, it's a big difference between me giving you a play that you've never read and said, learn all these lines, than giving me a script for playing Deacon for a character where I know all the storylines, I know my character, and I know all the other characters, I can learn it much quicker, right? So this to me was learning a play that I had never seen, and then, yeah, so. And to play in another language at that. Yeah, that was that was tricky because I speak Italian infinitely better than I did when I did the show. How has quarantine life been? Oh, it's been awesome. It's been Cirque du Soleil oh, every great. night. No. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm lucky that I've got, you know, I'm lucky that my wife and I are healthy. We're safe, um, that we're able to ride it out in, in comfort, um, you know, uh, it was very frustrating and demoralizing that in the, you know, the, the moment when um, Studio City was really poised to, you know, make that leap to the next level, that that the virus, um, you know, put the uh, put the brakes on that. But in the big in the big scheme of things, if that's the biggest problem that I've had compared to people that are losing their lives and losing loved ones, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any problems. Uh, I'm also lucky that, you know, my wife and I enjoy each other's company immensely. And we, you know, we, we had a lot of fun. Um, you know, really is a chance when you're <laughs> with somebody 24 hours a day like, like that, you know, you really either sink or swim. And I think for us, it really just sort of strengthened our relationship. Um, but I am very much ready for the world to uh, resume. Speaking of opening up the world, I think we've got some fans we'd like to open up the floor to. Sure. So, Alicia. Hi, how are you? I just wanted to ask you, how was it working with um, the quartermates, most especially Anna Lee? And, you know, Anna Lee, uh, for those of you who don't know, Anna Lee uh, played uh, Lila Quartermain, and she had such a sense of regalness to her. She really was, you know, it, it, she had a, a kind of like she was above all the fray. You know, when, when I was on the show initially, Steve Burton and I played brothers and we were constantly making jokes and, you know, constantly cutting up and having fun. And she would just laugh in her little, it almost sounded like Glinda, the good witch of the West, you know? And, um, <clears throat> you know, she, she was in a sound. Of, I mean, I mean, you know, she's, a, she's an amazing, she was an amazing lady and she really was so warm and loving. Like you would imagine uh, a grandmother would be, uh, I felt very honored to have worked with her. Uh, the Quartermains, you know, I, I love working with the Quartermains. I love being a Quartermain, um, all of them. Um, yeah, they were such a dysfunctional bunch, but they were also funny. And when the chips were down, no matter how much they were at each other's throats, they would pull together. And, uh, and, and I liked that. And, and of course I loved uh, my, my on-screen relationship with Steve Burton. I think up next we have Cheryl. Cheryl, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your questions. Oh my goodness, I have so many. <laughs> but they're great. Uh, one was, do you ever think you'll come back to Bold and the Beautiful? I mean, I, listen, I came back to General Hospital after 15 years, so I've learned to never say never. Um, you know, I, I, I think that would be great. I would, I would like to. I would very much like to uh, go back. I really enjoy working on the show. Um, and, it needs you know, a shake-up. It needs a shake-up bad. So, I mean, I'm open to it. Um, you know, they know, they know how to get a hold of me. And so. also, you worked with Chuck Norris and uh, Fran Drescher. I'm big fans of both. And yeah. I'm envious of that. Good for you. Well, I mean, listen, you know, I, I, I grew up uh, idolizing Chuck Norris. I remember one time my dad went to some event and got me an autographed picture of Chuck. 
and I'll never forget it. It said, Sean, keep on kicking. And decades later, uh, I was doing a fight scene with Chuck and working opposite him on Walker, Texas Ranger. And he was the nicest, coolest, kindest guy. And it was just amazing. Uh, really amazing experience and Fran Drescher is truly an exceptional human being uh, I worked with her on the nanny and then later on happily divorced and I'll tell you a funny story about happily divorced I was at a cancer schmancer event uh, and Fran was the she was the she was the guest of honor that you know and she said listen you know if, if you ever find yourself up for another role that's one of my shows let me know as luck would have it, I think four or five days later, I was up for happily divorced. And I didn't have Fran's number, but I, I, I had a contact for her. And to her credit, I don't know, I probably shouldn't say this, but Fran went to bat with me. It was incredible. I mean, you know, there's not very many times in Hollywood where people say things like that and keep their word. And, um, you know, she is really one of the, the good guys in the business. She's an amazing person. What is, has been your most memorable character that you've played? And if you could write a, a character just for you, what, what kind of character would that would he be? Well, moving backwards, I would have to say that, you know, the character that I created for Studio City, Sam Stevens, is really pretty close. I mean, you know, I wanted to create a character that would be as close to who I am and allow me to transmit as much honesty as possible. And that if the show succeeded, it would be in part because I was giving the audience the most honest version of who I am. And if it failed, it wasn't gonna fail because I was trying to play my idea of somebody else. I mean, who, who better than, than me knows what it's like to be working in daytime television for 30 years, do you know what I mean? So, so why, I, why I'd bring my experience to it. Um, um, what character has been my most memorable? I mean, most memorable, I'd have to say, you know, Mike Barnes from Karate Kid, just because, you know, the character has become recognizable worldwide due to the success of the show. Um, it's, it's definitely not my favorite character as far as performance wise, um, cause I think it's incredibly one dimensional and, you know, um, probably if I, I, played that character again it would be played somewhat differently but that's what the character required um deacon absolutely has been one of the most memorable characters for me for sure um there were times in the early part of my being on general hospital that that aj was because i thought it was such a rich multi-dimensional character and i and i would say that you know um i've, I've played austin in true west a couple times and and that's a character that i really love playing okay. i think at some point i'd like to do True West again and play the other character, Lee. I don't know if you know, you know the uh, play, but it's a terrific Sam Shepard play. So those, those are the ones. So I know that you are a chef, and the hot thing right now is the keto diet. Uh-huh. What do you feel about that? Hopefully you uh, don't eat all the fat and cholesterol you want. You know, <laughs> I, I tried it for a really long time and wasn't able to lose any weight on it. I... Um, because I found that I was eating too much. I find that everybody's metabolism and, and body chemistry works differently. Um, my wife does it and it works really well for her. She likes it and she's really diligent about it. Um, but keto, I mean, keto is definitely easy to cook. I mean, it's, you know, it's just meat and some green leafy vegetables, but uh, you know, I like, to, I like to cook things with a little more panache. So it wouldn't be my first choice for, for menu items. Can you elaborate on that? What we, 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 we want to tell you some of the things I like to cook. Is that what you mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's see. One of my go-tos is I like to make um, Moroccan spice couscous with uh, roasted vegetables and uh, uh, cumin spice lamb chops. That's a good one. Um, I like to make uh, uh, ooh, pasta puttanesca. Um, I, I, like, I, can't, I can't bake. There's a big difference between baking and cooking. Yep. But baking is mathematical and requires, requires strict adherence to recipe. And I like to do stuff that's a little more kind of bombastic and creative. And yeah. That sounds delectable. I like bombastic <laughs> and creative being applied to food. It shows a personality to it. Uh, well, thank you. I am noticing that our 45 minutes are nearly up. So just as a closing thing, what I would love to do is have you give 
one piece of advice that maybe you'd normally hold back, something that you would think maybe this person isn't ready for that, whether that's about acting, about life, about cooking, if you want to go into something I'm personally interested in hearing, but just whatever comes to mind, something that kernel of wisdom. Well, I, you know, I believe that everyone has a masterpiece within themselves and that masterpiece is their authentic self living your most authentic self and in living your most authentic life you in turn share something with the world and it's like the ripple effect you don't know who those ripples are going to affect and what it's going to ignite or give permission to someone else to do on their journey and so i would say that my my advice is to live your most authentic life to live it with uh persistence tenacity with audacity and boldness and along that journey to try and inspire and help as many people as you can and uh and 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 make the world a better place while living while living your dream that is sincerely beautiful thank you for that that is yeah thank you so much for joining us today i it was really a pleasure listening to you and really listening to talk about Karate Kid because that, that was one of my favorite shows. Oh. <laughs> and all the other things, um, I think you're, you just have so, many, so much to give and I've learned so much in this um, hour with you, 45 minutes. I think everyone else feels the same as well. So once again, Sean, thank you so much for thank being on our show. I really appreciate And you know what? We might ask you to come back again. <laughs> Anytime. Would love to. Michael, you know I love talking to you. Uh, guys, a, a, a wonderful rest of your weekend, and let's do this again, okay? Oh, Thank yes. you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, everybody.